Bible Studies. I'm the Director of the Sustainability Program here at Hamlin. And I would like to introduce my co-host today, Valerie Chep, who is the Director of the Social Justice Program. And together, we're incredibly excited to welcome Sara Khan to Hamlin. Sara is an artist and also an ethnobotanist and also a nutrition educator. And we met at a giant food studies conference in which the Society for the Anthropology of Food Nutrition and the Association for the Study of Food and Society and Agriculture, Food and Human Values Society and the Canadian Association of Food Studies, they all meet together. And Sarah had a wonderful exhibit showing in the exploration gallery of this conference in which people could come, they could engage with exhibits, she had a bunch of short films that were running, and people came in and they got right away what she was doing. One of the things that, that I think in both sustainability and environmental studies and also in social justice we aspire to do, which is to witness what's going on in the world, to listen carefully to it, and then to elevate the voices we hear without taking those voices away from people. So it's a really fine art to be able to help people tell their stories without telling it yourself in a way that that kind of bagels what they wanted to say. So I was wonderful at this, and I thought, who, who, could you come to Hamlin? She said, I would be happy to come to Hamlin. So over the past year, we've been planning this day. She'll be doing workshops with the Social Justice Capstone class and the Feeding and Crowd class in the afternoon, helping us think about how to tell our stories in the world in ways that we want people to be able to hear and that we want the voices we've heard to be heard. And so this morning, she's going to talk about some of the projects she's worked on. I won't give them away, I'm going to turn the mic over to her. But I would like to ask you to first turn off your cell phones and put them away. And then once you've done that, to help me give a really warm welcome to Sarah Khan. Can you hear me? Am I mic okay? Yeah. It falls off, I'll be fumbling with it. So thank you for that warm welcome, and thank you to Valerie Chet and Valerie Mike Denio and the Social Justice Program and Environment and Sustainability Program. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, before I delve into what we're going to talk about today, um, I want to just give you a little bit of my background and, and thankfully Valentine covered it uh, a bit. But I think it's always good, especially in educational institutions, to share the background uh, of, uh, of where we come from. Let me just start this again so I can properly time myself. There we go, okay. So um, I still don't know what I'm gonna be when I grow up, uh, so don't worry about necessarily figuring that out. What's more important is to always be in process and to be learning and engaging in ways that are uh, that are, that are beneficial to you and, and that hopefully aspire to or match your aspirations. So my undergraduate, and I'm a, I'm a hardcore liberal studies student uh, to this day, was um, in Middle Eastern history and Arabic. I wanted to have the skill sets to think uh, clearly, constructively, log logically, rationally. I wanted to obtain those skills. Um, then I did a joint master's, one in public health, one in nutrition, and ended up living in Israel and Palestine among the Bedouin. And it was um, among a Bedouin, it was with a Bedouin woman with whom I spent quite a bit of time. Um, it was a Bedouin family that refused to move off of the land, and therefore they had limited electricity and limited um, access to a lot of just basic services that we all rely on. And it was with Um Yusuf, Mother Yusuf, that I would go out in the morning and collect plants with her. And she, we would collect plants uh, not only for her own family uh, in terms of healing and nutrition, but also for the animals that she uh, uh, took care of. It was uh, uh, goats, and she would make cheese from that goats, and the money she made from selling that cheese was hers. And I was in my 20s, and I was, I was um, I was not aware what was going on unconsciously, but what was happening is that I decided, I went back, I finished my two degrees, but I said, uh, but I realized I did not want to be a lab scientist. It didn't interest me. I'm happy to read the results of that work, to, to benefit from those knowledge systems, and to benefit from people who engage in that kind of work, but I want to be 
I much preferred being out in the field. And a lot of my work until that point has always been kind of re-remembering that and saying, wait, 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 do you want to be the um, administrator or do you want to be in the field? So just knowing that has been I came back and I marched up to the New York Botanical Garden and introduced myself to the head of the Institute of what they call Economic Botany, which is a fancy way of talking about people and plants and how we engage with them. Michael Bailick ended up being my PhD advisor for about um, six or seven years. And I did a PhD in a discipline that we call Ethnobotany. I prefer to call it the study of people and plants. And um, also in retrospect, what I've done all my life is basically do what I've probably been doing since I was 10 which is in some way travel at the spice routes to engage with people, learn languages, eat, and most of the time that someone else paid for it. Um, I encourage you to do that in my basic if that's what you want to do. So I looked at Ayurveda, which is a traditional South Asian healing system, and traditional Chinese medicine, and looked at how they treat what we call type 2 diabetes. So that's a trajectory. I didn't end up staying in the, in the academic world. Um, again, it was that remembering of uh, what was important to me. And it, it, in terms of my actions, in terms of the kind of work I wanted to do, it wasn't a double-blind placebo-controlled study. I didn't, I didn't want to be doing those things. Um, so I left the, the medical school and ended up now being an artist, multimedia person, um, sharing all the knowledge that I've gained and the skill sets and hopefully putting them into the films. So one of the projects that I'm working on, and there's several, but one of them that I'm working on um, is called the Queen's Migrant Kitchens, and I, I actually prefer to call it just Migrant Kitchens. And about two years ago, I had my second Fulbright, a senior scholar Fulbright, um, and I was in India again. Um, I was born in Pakistan, but raised in the United States. But I was in India where I've done a lot of my field work, and I was, um, I was, uh, this year, that year was dedicated to doing a series of short films on Indian women farmers. And going to talk about that in the afternoon. I'm not going to be doing that today, right now. But when I was coming back, um, one of the things that I did when I was in India is I did a series of short articles on Old Delhi. Old Delhi has a lot of meaning to me. My father's family had lived there before the partition. But I had done a series of uh, multimedia pieces on Old Delhi, and so I pitched to the media organization called Culinary Backstreet. I said, coming back, I need a job. I want to continue doing this. So I proposed it to them, and we came up with this idea of the Migrant Kitchens collaboratively. And I've continued to do that, even though I'm not working with them anymore. So what came out of that um, was a lot of things, and a lot of it was my commitment to social justice, my version of it, um, was to make visible the invisible bear witness, and also to be seriously playful and playfully serious, and that's just more a reflection of my own character, was to always infuse it with that because <laughs> I tend to operate from a lot of anger and rage. Um, and if I express that all the time, nobody really wants to work with me, nobody really wants to talk to me, they don't want to work with angry people. So how do I take that and make it into something beautiful um, and, uh, and share that? So the Queen's Migrant Kitchens. Um, I chose Queen's New York because it's one of the most diverse places in the world, over 160 languages alone are spoken among a population of about 2.3 million people. And, uh, and so I thought, okay, if I'm, if I'm based at home, I still need to be traveling. And so I can travel the number seven train and I can hang out in Queens and, and I can feel like I'm, I'm anywhere in the world. So, um, so what this intro is gonna include, and I'm gonna try and keep it to about 15 more minutes, if at all, and then uh, I'm going to talk about the seven short films we're going to show you today. Uh, it, it's about 25 minutes in total, and you're going to see them in, in sequence. And um, I want to give you a little bit of background about Queens, New York. So this is on Roosevelt Avenue in Queens, which is one of the major thoroughfares. And there's a wonderful number seven buck train that goes above, and it's visually stunning. Maybe I'm romanticizing it, but it is very romantic. It's, it's just beautiful. Um, and so this is um, at the crossroads of Roosevelt Avenue and Warren Street. And Warren Street has a huge amount of uh, street food vendors. So these are probably two Ecuadorian women who are actually running an outdoor street vendor stall that is owned by a restaurant. Um, and they had 
a couple of uh, women working there throughout the day, selling Ecuadorian food. It's, um, it's PR for the restaurant, and we can talk about some of those things later. But before I wanted to go into Queens, I wanted to pay homage to um, people who were before this, who lived there before it was settled and colonized. And so that meant first looking at, all right, what did New York look like? Uh, what did the U.S. look like um, before colonization? This is a map um, of Native American tribes in North America. There was rich diversity there in terms of cultural diversity, linguistic diversity, people diversity. And so we needed, I felt that before I even begun speaking about, speaking about Queens, I needed to talk about what was there before. And so before it was colonized, uh, here is a, a map of Queens again, a map of New York. This is before it was called Queens. I'm sorry, that's not the best quality um, uh, uh, <coughs> map. But um, this is Queens of New York before it, and over here is what we now call Queens. Um, Kings County, up here is Brooklyn, and Queens is in this area now. And I want us to remember that um, a lot of the major roads, highways that we find in Queens today were uh, at first Native American uh, uh, trading routes. And if you're going to colonize, and if you're going to colonize really effectively, you don't destroy what's there, you build upon what's there. And so when you look at Queens today, what you see is that, and this is just a few readings of some articles about the history of Queens and the Native Americans in Queens. You can see Old Rockaway Trail is a major thoroughfare that leads to the famous Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn. The North-South Trail is a major interstate um, in, 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 in Queens today. And so these thir there's a memory there. There's a visibility there. And, and they're, they're, they're embedded. We just need to see them and learn how to see them. So let's fast forward. So um, let's fast forward and look at Queens today. This is based on 20, um, I think 2010 census data. I've worked with a wonderful uh, map maker and uh, we've taken a lot of the census data from, that's available online. And we mapped Queens, there's 53 neighborhoods in Queens and um, there is, uh, of the 53 neighborhoods, what I have listed here are the top six most ethnically diverse neighborhoods. Jackson Heights, Elmhurst, Corona, Flushing, Ford's Hills, and South Rose Oak Park, and they're highlighted here. And what we see here is um, the languages that are spoken. So in Jackson Heights, you know, if you know anything about New York, think, people think of Jackson Heights, they think South Asians, they think, oh, it must be an Indian language. The most spoken language in Jackson Heights is actually Spanish, English, then languages from the South Asian, uh, uh, what I like to call the subcontinent, or the subcontinent, um, then Chinese languages, and then like Hindi. Um, so I wanted to look at Queens from a language perspective, but the thing about Queens, New York, is English, Spanish, and Chinese languages uh, dominate the landscape. And I wanted to show, well, so I said, so let's eliminate those languages, and what are the next languages um, are spoken in Jackson Heights? So before we had Spanish and Chinese languages and, um, and um, English dominating, if you take away those layers, what diversity is revealed under that? So what's coming up next? Um, and then you see other Indic languages, Hindi, Urdu, Russian, uh, and you can see that for each area. South Ozone Park, Forest Hills, is you have a huge number of, of, of Jews there. There's one film that you're gonna see about um, some Uzbeki Jews who now live in Queens and their bakery. But I wanted to also talk about Queens and reveal the layers, because what I'm doing is, when I'm, when I'm taking this data, and revealing it to you or showing it in different ways, I'm also revealing the layeredness that each of us are as individuals. You know, I'm not just a Pakistani American. I'm not just a Muslim American, you know. I've got, you know, the Jackson 5 in me and I've got hip hop in me and I've got other languages in me besides what I grew up with. And I'm layered 
just as everyone else is in this uh, room. Well, it's the same with this. I wanted to not just look at languages, because if you look at Spanish speaking, well, that's a lot of Latin America, but what's underneath that? So I wanted to look at the maps from um, the country of origin. So again, same, same areas, but the country of, of origin in Jackson Heights, Ecuador, Colombia, Colombia, Mexico, then Bangladesh, and then China. Um, so again, it was interesting to see not just the languages spoken, because if it's Arab speaking, that's a large swath of people, but where's the area that they're from? Because that reveals to us cultural diversity, um, biological diversity, linguistic diversity. What Moroccans speak is not the same as what Egyptians speak in the home, even though it's classical Arabic, for example. And then again, I wanted to eliminate those Spanish-speaking places, English-speaking places, and places where Chinese languages were spoken, so we could reveal another layer of diversity. So here is a map revealing that. Um, uh, So that's before we eliminate it. And then this is, um, and then, and I don't have the other map, so excuse me, I made a mistake. I'm willing to totally uh, own up to it. I must have deleted it in a moment. Um, so anyways, what, if we eliminate it, you see a whole other layer of less known languages, smaller populations from where people come to show the linguistic diversity there. So this is a little background about Queens and Queens, New York. Now I'm just going to go into um, the first film after the introductory film, which is about the Negro Motorist Travel Guides. Um, in about 1936, a gentleman who was a postal worker developed a series of um, travel guides um, geared towards African Americans because although the car had been invented and now middle class folks were able to buy them and it represented all this freedom when the sun went down and you were traveling and you were African American, you had to worry about where you were gonna sleep um, and if you were gonna get stopped and you had to worry about the, your, protecting yourself and also the people traveling with you. So they made, he made a series, uh, he systematically mapped um, the United States and then Mexico to show places where you safe haven. So that the first, the second film you're gonna see is about the Negro Motors Travel Guides. And um, this is uh, uh, Queens, New York, based on the demographics of people who identify as black or African Americans, again, based on 2010 uh, data. And you see Jamaica as um, with the highest population, although St. Albans is one of the oldest African American populations, a lot of African Americans came 1930s and 40s, from the Great Migration. Um, everyone talks about Brooklyn and Harlem, but Queens, it was happening there too, and so the film will talk about that a little bit. Here's Jamaica, Queens broken down. Again, how can we look at the world? How can we map the world? Um, sometimes I'm, well, we could talk about this in the Q&A, but um, what do maps represent, and how are they uh, representations of power and control, and who's telling the story? But we can touch on that later. And then here's Jamaica and St. Albans, again, revealing the diversity, predominantly African American, but the changing demographics show people from Guyana, Bangladesh, Ecuador, El Salvador, the Dominican Republic, Trinidad, Tobago, um, much different, um, for example, than in other parts of Queens, like Flushing, which is predominantly large Asian population. Here's Herbert Houston. And when you see his store, that looks like it's on a side road in the Georgia, which is where he's originally from. So um, it's very important to remember that uh, as immigrants, as migrants, um, I have a dear, dear friend, and my husband and I often quote him when we talk about migrants, um, is people might come empty handed, but they don't come empty headed. They come with so much knowledge about place, language, food ways, stories. And so we come here and we transform it and we transform ourselves and we bring richness and diversity. And so I just love how, you know, peanuts and, and ham hocks and honey, um, and this is how it's displayed and the beauty of that. And I'm sure you see that here in your farmer's market. 
Taylor, Taylor Green. I was, um, I'll go into the story later, but her mom ran a fish and chip place that was famous during the Great Migration, and it was right down the road from a place that we're going to talk about in the Negro Motors Travel Guide film. But this is the owner of the house, this beautiful cardboard, painted, designed um, uh, banner that she still had up that was made by a local artist, and that's how this was animated. And you'll see that in the film. Then we get to uh, the Jewish part of Queens, and um, Uzbekistan is in Central Asia, and I spent a day documenting the baking tradition there, and I felt like I was in Old Delhi. There was a huge walk in Tandoor, or Tandoor, and uh, um, the mother, the matriarch, her name was Sarah also, I got her to recite a poem um, that, I, that I translated from Tajik, and, uh, and so, again, these, these rich diversities that exist in, in New York. And I end this little uh, introduction with um, how another focus of some of the films that you're going to see, which is about peddlers, police, and power, and street vendors. Peddlers, police, and power from 1906 all the way to the present. How street vendors, how new immigrants and older immigrants are negotiating, negotiating and trying to make a life in New York. And when you look at the debates and conversations that um, were had in 1906, based on the document that I, I read and talk about, um, the debates haven't changed very much. So uh, I think I'll end with that. It's been about 18 minutes. And what we can do now is maybe go to the films and watch those films, a series of seven. And, uh, and I heard we're eating arepas after, and one of the films is about Luis Alfonso Marín from Colombia and his amazing arepas, and, um, and then I guess we'll take Q&A. Is that good? Great. Okay. So I'm gonna close that. <coughs> Immigrants define Queens today, and for the next year, Culinary Backstreets and I, Sarah Khan, will explore migrant kitchens from the world's most diverse community, Queens, New York. For folks who've never been to Queens, the best way to begin an exploration is on foot, and that means hopping first on the number seven train. The last stop on the seven is Flushing, and when you step off into the neighborhood, it feels like a bustling downtown Shanghai. There's little English and plenty of street food vendors. South Ozone Park is a hike, but worth every ounce of goat curry you can consume in one city. People from Guyana, Trinidad, Tobago, and India dominate the landscape. Forest Hills has a sizable Asian presence. Parts have an old European world feel but it's also home to a great number of Jewish, Russians, and Uzbeks. The neighborhoods of Elmhurst, Corona, and Jackson Heights are next to each other. Asians and Latinos are represented mostly in this region. On one side of Roosevelt Avenue, you can find everything you need for a Sichuan meal. On the other side are spices and produce required for your get stew. And if you don't want to create it yourself, a Oaxacan feast from a street vendor awaits. To finish it all off, you can get a perfect cake made by Dominican or Argentinian hands. To learn how Queens became so diverse, see detailed maps and hear from the immigrants themselves in their own words, visit culinarybackstreets.com for a deeper, year-long exploration of migrants and their kitchens. Victor A. 
Rich Green was an employee of the U.S. Postal System from Harlem, New York. In 1936, he published the first edition of the Negro Motorist Green Book. He wanted to provide to a larger African-American community a listing of establishments to get gas, eat, meet others, listen to music, and rest and sleep on their visits to New York without hostility or the threat of violence. The automobile, now more available, conjured a world with open roads to voyage with wonder, spontaneity, and freedom. But this romantic notion certainly did not apply to all. The Jim Crow era came to personify a system of government-sanctioned racial oppression and segregation in the United States. By 1949, though, the Green Books had become so popular that they covered all of the United States, Canada, Bermuda, and Mexico. Green continued and published the series for nearly 30 years, till Johnson signed the Civil Rights Bill into law in 1964, ending the legal practice of segregation. Queens, New York, and in particular the Jamaica Queens neighborhood, is the heart of an old African-American community. Many African-Americans moved to Queens from Harlem and Brooklyn in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. According to the early green books from the late 40s and into the early 50s, three taverns are listed in Jamaica. Tolliver's Tavern on New York Boulevard was one of the beloved houses of music where many jazz and blues greats played for all who passed through, local and visitors. To learn more about the history of Tolliver's Tavern and Marie's Fish and Chip Takeout nearby, the present-day Rip Shack in Houston's seedless watermelons around the corner on Linden Boulevard and the West African Cuisine on Sutphin Boulevard, visit the Migrant Kitchen series at culinarybackstreet.com. Can you smell the yeast in the dough rising? The non or toki, two types of Bukharan bread baking, where the samsa, caramelized onions with spices and ground meat stuffed into a dough, browning in the tanur. Rukhat Kosher Bakery, located on Austin Street in Rigo Park, Queens, New York, is a haven of all these smells. Run by Roshil and Rafael Samekov, they came from Bukhara in Uzbekistan in the early 1990s when the Soviet Union collapsed. Today, with Roshil mainly in the front of the house and Rafael overseeing the samsa and non making, I documented their day's work along with their co workers. The bakers produced their signature toke and the smaller tokjas, crunchy, cracker like circles used in dips and spreads. Louise rolls the dough, puts it through a machine, and cuts out circles that are then baked to a crisp in a small oven, stacked then packaged in bags or cardboard boxes for transport once cooled. Rafael hovers over and around the tenud. He tends to the baking samsa, savory ground meat pies that magically stick to the sides of a traditionally sized tenud until crusty and bronze. He then skillfully scrapes them off the sides and drops them steaming on the waiting pan. Non making is another labor of dough mixing, rising, cutting, and shaping. Rafael and Gilberto slap a wooden circle over the ball of dough to flatten it and then flick their hand around the edges. With their fingers, they deftly create another pattern into the bread. Each stage reveals an embodied, rhythmic, signature gesture and sound. Rafael prepares a large walk in the nude by spraying it with water to increase the moisture. Gilberto adds the final touch and stamps a metal design that further embeds sprinkled sesame seeds in yet another geometric pattern. Rafael is now ready to receive the finish knot to steadily place them on the waiting wall till it is covered with oblongs and circles of baking goodness. By 3 p.m., the samsar being sold, the tokja packaged, and the naan scraped off the curved walls of the tenur. 
To learn more about the Samikov's journey to Queens, the larger Bukhara, Uzbek, and Jewish communities in the area, visit us in our Migrant Kitchen series at culinarybackstreets.com. In New York City, in all boroughs, street vending is a way to make a living, especially for recent immigrants. But the road to vending legally is fraught with obstacles. The people have permit them the working, and they make money to sell the permit illegally to 25,000, 20,000. I want to tell you, the, the city council and everybody authorities will need the, the people working, they need permit. My title is Director of the Street Vendor Project. We are part of the Urban Justice Center. I want to recognize our council member, Dennis Rodriguez. He supports us, as do many other council members. So today, there are children, there are parents, sisters and brothers from across New York City and across the country. The vast majority of these people sell food and merchandise on our streets every day. Many people don't know that there's a limited number of permits and licenses in New York City for street vendors. As a result, there are fines, people are arrested, and ticketed every day. It's 
been this way since 1981. People have been, been waiting for the right to simply work legally. They simply want a badge, a permit, a license to be able to sell the food and merchandise on our city streets. They're not asking for help from anybody except a simple right to work. They pay their taxes, and we've been waiting now, asking the city council for two years, very simply, lift that cap on permits, lift that cap on licenses, give us spaces to work, and give it to us now. We can't wait Vendors provide a valuable service, and yet many are harassed regularly. Most vendors, despite constant obstacles, know that the services they provide only improve New York and its rich diversity. <laughs> Street food vending in New York City is a controversial undertaking. Vendors have hawked and sold as long as people have colonized and migrated to the United States. New York vendors are predominantly first-generation migrants, and Queens, New York is no exception. They sell on the streets to make an honest living in often challenging circumstances. Luis Alfonso Marin, a beloved street food vendor who's known for his arepas made from ground corn, came to the United States legally 34 years ago from Colombia. He pays homage to his country of origin. Because the name of this car is the Saboroso Paracataca. You know, in one way, it's in honoring the memory of uh, of a cow. Well, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, more knowledge in him as cow. A little uh, writing in front of the car and he's talking about this. He says, I feel like a Latin American from any place. That any place is any place in the world. As Latin America, right? And so in that way. So in that way, it means share with any people from any place around the world. And I like that. So it's one of the things when people read it, I think uh, they get a little bit from that. <laughs> I'm usually a big choreographer and a theater director. I'm teaching theater, I mean, I was involved in many things with that. And when I came here, I came here waiting to do many things. When I came here, no more. Uh, I get, I get in another world. In another world, the world of making money. <laughs> but the road to making money proved harder than he imagined. With a competitive art world and little English ability, Louis first worked for other vendors and later for himself without a permit. He sold on the streets for 18 years, and it's only in the last three years that he finally got a permit to vend legally after a 16-year waiting period. With license. And no permit. With permit, three years. 
Summertime is good to work at night time. Winter time, no good. <laughs> but summertime is good to work in the night time. Many people, uh, many different cultures, because there is the Arepas. <laughs> The Arepas con queso, the best around the world. <laughs> In addition to the high interest he has to pay on his new food cart, Luis says the biggest problem with vending at night is alcohol. When people get drunk, it's very, very upset, very difficult to attend. It's, it's hard. People want to buy. <laughs> want to buy with you, don't want to pay, blah, blah, blah. And the best thing is let them go. The hours are long. Luis is on his feet all night, and now he's in his 60s, so he often has an assistant. This summer, Luis has hired his friend's son, a young immigrant, who respects him like a father. My name is Marvin, Marvin Cervantes. I started working recently with Luis. I was born and raised in Mexico City, Coyoacan. Well, what I'm doing here, working, trying to hopefully get into a good college, get to college, be, um, a neurologist and uh, learn more <laughs> that's what it's all about learning and to find somebody who's way older than me who's had more experience have a similar mind like mine who's always childlike who's always in wonder who's always finding things funny and disregarding all the bad things that could be and still happen it's, it's amazing I can finally connect with somebody that has a similar mindset to mine. And not only really similar, but he's expanding my mindset, my mindset, my ideas, my, my cultures, the, the cultures that I know. It's just, it's great. So go meet this duo this summer in Jackson Heights on the corner of 80th Street and Roosevelt Avenue. Arepas and much kindness await your late night exploration of migrants and their kitchens. Evelia Coetzee arrived from Tlaxcala, Mexico with her family in 2000. She migrated like most with the hope for a better future for herself and her family. She's a street vendor who sells tamales on the corner of Roosevelt and Junction Avenues in Corona, Queens, New York. Courageous and without a permit to sell, Evita spent many years dodging police and restaurant owners and avoiding arrest. <laughs>
Nvidia fights for the simple right to work, to take care of her family, and to live without fear. Sorry. Did I leave it on? I think we're okay. <laughs> okay, thanks. Sorry about that. Oh. Which is right there. Oh, okay. So we'll take Q and A. If there are any questions. There's, we can talk about process, we can talk about engaging with communities, we can talk about anything you want to talk about. About how you work with folks, how you get stories. Yes. You talked a little bit about your academic background, but um, I'd love to hear a little bit about how you learned how to do filmmaking work. Um, and then also maybe a little bit about your decision to make short films in the format of the short format. Thank you for that. So um, with so many degrees, I didn't want to, I don't want to go to school anymore. I just, I'm tired of that. Um, but what's nice about having gone to school so much is that um, you know how to learn. And so um, I think one of the reasons why me and many people are doing multimedia is because it's more affordable and it's accessible. And it's not in the domain of you know, tens, and, tens and tens and thousands of dollars in order to make stuff. You can use your iPhone and make really amazing stuff. Um, so that was it. Um, so that was the first question. It, was, it, it became a lot more affordable, so it was a, a medium that one could explore. And uh, trial and error, trial and error, trial and error. Um, and the other reason, and then the other reason why short films, because if I'm gonna work on my craft, I thought it's better to screw up over and over and over and over again with short films instead of doing one long one. I just feel like I'm, you can always work on your craft in a small way. And uh, it's just, it's more affordable too. It's, it's so, there's so many steps and layers to the whole process. Uh, and when you work independently and mainly alone, uh, it's, it's just overwhelming. And, um, and the other point is that we have a community in a world that has less attention span. And we really shifted from, well actually I don't, we privilege now more visual culture than the written word, and it's just the way it is. Uh, when I have an article, there's less hits than if I have a photo, and there's less hits than if I have um, a film or a clip. And so if I want to get a message across, what are the mediums, uh, how do I reach the people? Uh, and so I, I find the multimedia, I also just find a lot of fun, like the challenge of it all is how do you bring these disparate things, you know, how do you remember to turn the sound on because there's so much footage where I forgot to turn the sound on and it's so nice to meet other, you know, established filmmakers like, yeah, I forgot to turn off the sound. It's like, yay, I'm not the only one, you know. 
um, and they still forget. Or uh, and it's it's cooking to me. It's cooking. It's cooking. Uh, yeah, thanks. That was great. Um, and I'm just curious in this project, um, who you, you know, what is your audience? Who, who do you want to reach in, you know, this work you're doing? And what kinds of impacts are you, you know, hoping to have or intending to have? I get asked that question a lot. And you're asked that question a lot about your audience, about, um, it's a, it's a good question and it's a layered response. The first is, um, as an artist, I want to make something that I find valuable and that has meaning to me. And that's my main motivating factor. Uh, it's nice to be old enough or to have enough, enough experience to be confident in that if there's something that I'm passionate about, the likelihood that other people will like it, it, it will be high. I think it's important to think about your audience. I think it's important to think about the impact that you want to have and how you want to have that. But I try to focus on the process and a lot of those issues get worked out. And that process means a kind of slow filmmaking as opposed to fast filmmaking, which means, um, and my stuff tends not to be directly polemical. Uh, or controversial because my work wants to be about making visible the invisible ordinary people, in my opinion, who are doing extraordinary things every single day. And uh, normalizing their, them being on, on, in, on a film for an extended period of time, speaking full sentences that aren't sound bites, uh, expressing themselves and their, their multiple intelligences and agencies and abilities. So my audience, what ends up happening is I end up finding my audience by putting it out there and seeing who likes it. Uh, I don't know if it's the best advice, but it's how I roll, and I have to respect how I roll. Um, does that respond to your question and, and the other part of your question? No, I think you, you, you answered both parts. Thanks. Uh, well, one other part is, um, I've worked with a whole bunch of different uh, organizations in Queens. They see Rising Up and Moving, which is a group of South Asians that began before 9-11 for immigrant labor rights. The New York, um, uh, New York Community Empowerment Group, which works with predominantly Latino um, uh, construction workers, including men and women. Um, Queens, um, Queens uh, Migrant Kid, the Queens Museum of Art, we're doing a show there in November, highlighting uh, a community, in their community space, we're gonna be uh, documenting, showing the films, having three community uh, events, um, highlighting the, the Migrant Kitchen series. Um, Queens Museum of the Moving Image is, is showcasing my eighth film, which is about, I could talk about that maybe later. Um, so in terms of impact and how it's getting out in the world, what suddenly happened is, and this is just good advice for everybody. Keep making, keep making, keep making, create your body of work, create your body of work, uh, because you will only get better if you're serious about it and if you keep making. Um, and then what tends to happen is you, then, you can present this body of work that I'm doing for you now, and then people pay attention, or uh, Valentine comes to a conference and we have a conversation and then she goes more deeply and she says this would benefit I'd like other people to see this in another part of the country to hear about these queens and see the parallels here because every city is layered, every city has diversity, as do rural areas. So there's a lot of social engagement with the communities. Um, and you see the you see all the results of people who wanted to work with me. You don't see all the results of people like, I'm afraid, I'm suspicious, I don't know who you are, um, I don't want to talk to you. Uh, you see the results of people who did want to talk, the doors that I, that open to me. There are many doors that don't open. Uh, and we can, we can talk about that if, if at some point you want to hear about, um, a little bit about the next project and what's going to be at, uh, highlighted at the Queens Museum of the Moving Image on April 19th. Thank you.
have a follow-up question to the question that the gentleman asked uh, about audience, and it's about something that is what always hinders me in my passionate work and following what I want is funding, yes. right? And it's like, I, I think you're fascinating, but then I wonder, it's like, how does she do it? How, how does she buy the street food from the street vendors to right. eat and keep, like, keep an existence going? And maybe that's, uh, like, yeah. for the younger people, that's maybe also a question that yeah. would be valid as well. So I call it the hustle. And um, I, I should have mentioned there are a list of people that have funded private donors, um, organizations, Culinary Backstreets, um, the Asian American Writers Workshop is funding the work right now, um, Asian Women's Giving Circle, uh, the Sillins Foundation, which is a family-run foundation that focuses on anything um, that has to do with Jewish culture, um, Buenas Obras Foundation that has funded my work. So. Um, it's a constant hustle, and what I'm going to be doing a lot this summer is sitting back and, um, and uh, uh, making a list of uh, grants, philanthropists, uh, filmmaking grants, and just going through that, sorry, thinking, uh, systematically to keep that funding coming in. Um, and also, and this is very important, is, um, is saying no to work for free. <coughs> Uh, when people want to benefit from it. And that doesn't mean uh, not being uh, generous or being charitable, but it means very, being very clear about um, your time and how you use it. And as, as, as women, we're taught to be, kind of do it automatically. Um, the, our cultures, many cultures, teach us to do that. And it's really important to say, yes, I'd love to come, and this is my fee. Um, or if you'd like to have a talk, what I do and or some type of an exchange uh, and saying no you know there's a couple places that it would give me great coverage and I'm kind of tired of saying no I don't need your free coverage I don't need your free publicity I don't care if it's going to go out to three million people um, I know your budget I know how you work I know you can afford this um, and then if it's someone who says we have no funds and we're an NGO or a non-government organization will you come of course, but I choose my charities. Other people don't choose my charities for me. So it's really learning how to say no and be like, oh, am I doing the right thing? Oh no, am I getting up? Should I be talking to those three million people? Should I get it out there? How are they going to edit me? Is are they going to edit me in a way that you know? So it's all these things that I'm constantly asking myself. Um, but saying no so I can do the work instead of run around showing the work and then end up making five cents per hour. It's hard because we're not taught to do that. We're supposed to be grateful. Of course, I'm grateful, but I will choose my charity. <laughs> Hi. Hi, I'm Ruthie. Um, I just wanted to thank you for your time. It's my pleasure. Truly inspiring. Um, I think what I've noticed in some of these films is just a, a very apparent power dynamic between people of color, especially migrant workers, and the government and police forces, etc. Um, and I was just curious, what do you see for the future of food truck and food stand workers? Um, do you see policy that currently like kind of others these um, these groups of people? And do you see that like becoming? I don't know. Uh, do you see a positive change in the, in the future? All of these films were done before the recent elections, and I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna respond to that in a roundabout kind. Way. And you can interrupt me and say, hey, wait a minute, what do you mean about this or that or the other thing? And it also leads into um, the, the next film that's going to be premiered at, in Queens at the Museum of the Moving Image. So before um, November 8th and for the last year, I've been reading a lot um, about who here has read um, Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow or knows about it? Um, who's been reading Brian Stevenson, um, who works in the South, getting people off of, who've been on, who are on death row uh, and, have, um, and have been proved to be innocent and who have been, uh, so I was reading all this stuff and uh, getting very angry because I told you that thing happened to me. Like, I'm just rageful about what's happening. And, uh, and even prior to that, and actually this goes to beginning the mic, I'm, I'm going about, I'm flying around, but I will land, so just fly around with me for a little while. Um, 
When I first started the Queen's Migrant Kitchens, I thought, okay, you've lived in the Middle East, your Arabic is bad enough to make people laugh when you approach them, and if they laugh, they're gonna wanna work, at work with you because laughter, that's how I work. Um, and so I said, I'm gonna go to that part of Queens, which is in Astor Astoria, where there's a large Arab population, predominantly, um, I think of Moroccan descent as Lebanese. Um, and so I went hanging out, and I'm pretty good at it, you know, I know how to do it. I spent my life hanging out, talking about food, getting someone else to pay for it, documenting it in some way, you know, I know how to do it. And I even have some language facility, you know, so it's not, and I just could not make waves. I was like, what is going on here? You know, I'd make a connection with someone who's making these great um, um, sausages, a Palestinian guy, and his boss was Egyptian, and then I go to a Lebanese place, and I go to Morocco, nobody would talk to me. Everybody talks to me. <laughs> everybody talks to me. And, um, <laughs> and of course, I hadn't done my due diligence, and I was naive. Um, and this is a part of Queens, and this is 2014, 2015. And so I said, okay, let me leave that alone. Let me go hang out with the Latinos in Corona, because I knew that they were more politicized, they were more activated, there were more organizations catering to their needs, and they were less fearful about being active in the community and being visible. They knew their rights, they had been educated in their rights, more so than other communities. So I did what I often do, which I, I started reading other things. And of course, there are two Pulitzer Prize winning authors from Associated Press, I don't think they're there anymore, who wrote about surveillance um, since 9-11 um, in New York City, perpetuated by the NYPD. Not only surveillance, but um, uh, uh, informants, um, and it's no different than COINTELPRO in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, and what's happening to Muslim communities and communities of color. And again, this is before November 8th. And I started reading and reading, and then I was like, Sada, you know, here you are, a student of Middle Eastern history, and it, you know, hello, wake up, you know, wake up. People didn't want to talk to you because they had been um, surveyed, they had been harassed, and they're suspicious of any outsiders. Because a lot of the government uses informants who are from the community, who are South Asian and Arab, who speak the languages, um, to infiltrate. And this is documented. I'm not, you know, this isn't fake news. This is Human Rights Watch. These are respected organizations that have done extensive investigative respectable investigative reporting that are talking about this. This is nothing new, uh, and it's documented. So the next film is called um, Surviving Surveillance Catering to America, and it's about a Pakistani woman who lives in Queens whose son was um, surveyed and tracked uh, 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 by the NYPD and is now serving a 30-year sentence. But the story is about her, because of course we should hear about her son, of course that should be known, but what happens to the families that we destroy, that we infiltrate, that we break, how do they survive? Um, I think the, the othering, the people, the people of color, uh, I guess when you live it and know it so well, um, talking about it is not some huge revelation. This is what we're a country that I think aspires to democracy. I don't know if, ever, if we ever attain it. Um, and I think that is democracy. It's a continual aspiration of striving towards it. And that means um, engaging in communities, engaging in difference, engaging in diversity. It's a continual conversation that we have to keep happening. And so I use these films to try and keep that engagement happening, uh, hopefully, in the Way that is um, palatable, pun intended, um, and engaging, and, and, and um, hooks you to then ask those larger questions. So I hope that gives you some kind of indication of where I'm coming from. A couple of questions, if there are no other questions at the moment. There are kind of off-screen questions. So one is um, many, especially the early films ask people to go to culinary back streets yeah. to explore further. So I'm yeah. curious if you could talk a little bit more about what's there. Like what 
So Culinary Bat Speech was founded by these two guys who are American uh, citizens, journalists, who went and lived in Istanbul, Turkey. And um, I started going there about 10, eight years ago for conferences. And as an ethnobotanist, I was interested in the foods and food ways. And, um, and so they had these, they still have these great food tours. And um, the other thing I do, and this is also good for networking, um, I went to Smith College as an undergraduate, and whenever I go in the world, I look for alum who are wherever I'm going, because if there's someone there that I could hook up with um, and learn more faster in a, in, a, in, a, in a welcoming environment, why not? So I found a woman who's now bat based back in DC, but lived in Turkey for very long, was a Smith woman, and, so I, we went on their tours, whenever we go back, we go, and they do really good food tours. They tried to make the invisible visible. Um, they're doing good work, and it's the story behind the food, and it's regular cooks. Um, it's not what I call the shishi food or the shishification of food, and it's not the elite food world, and there's nothing the matter with that. It can exist, and I'm happy for it. I don't have to participate in it. Um, but it's just regular folks making food to survive entrepreneurs. And so they had these great tours, and Istanbul was such a great place. So over the years, I developed a relationship with them. The Smith woman that I knew was an editor with them. So when I went to India, I pitched to them, hey, why don't I do some stuff on Delhi? And I did. So when I came back, I could pitch to them. So they continue to do great work. And they work um, all over the world. And uh, they still have Istanbul, in uh, Lisbon, in Shanghai, in Mexico City. They continue to do great work. I am not working with them directly anymore, uh, but um, but it's a wonderful organization and it's a food site that I have a lot of respect for. There's lots of food sites that I'm not as interested in, just like in all your all your disciplines or something that attracts you, and their work attracted me very much. Does that answer your question? So did you include like outtakes or longer interviews? I'm curious, kind of of the mechanics of what was there, like. On the website, it's still there. Okay. Yeah, you can go to culinarybackstreets.com and look up the Queen's Migrant Kitchens and the articles. Each each for each one, there was one or two articles um, with the Rokhat Kusher Bakery. I have that one minute poem with a translation, um, and then the films are there too. So you get a larger context. The idea was to create a historical context, maybe one story written, and then a visual, um, so we could hit. People who like to read, people who want to listen to a poem, people who want to see a visual, uh, doing a lot, doing a lot. And I'm asking this partly in a teacherly way because yeah. we're at the time of the term where you have to pull your projects together right. and have like that three to five minute version. But it's also nice to know that there's a place you can put some of the things that you thought were really interesting that didn't fit into the book. Yeah, book. yeah, yeah. There's so much that does that ends up on the, as we say, the virtual cutting room floor now. So the second question I have is, I'm wondering if you could say a little bit, um, kind of prefacing, because a lot of people won't necessarily get to see the South Asian women farmers, mm -hmm. but, but one of the things that I have found so compelling is the creation of the superhero that all of you have seen in the poster for this event. Yeah. And just a little bit about um, the way you've navigated narrating some of this stuff. You mean why she exists? It comes from rage. Um, <laughs> it's layered, as we all are, and when I, when I talk about this, I'm, I'm, I'm also, you know, deeply encouraging you to do the same, is to look at and understand your own layeredness, and the multiple selves that you are, and, and what you embody in terms of culture, language, religion, traditions, uh, food ways, and so, um, so I'm a Pakistan. I'm a Pakistani American. I was born in Pakistan. I grew up in the United States. Uh, I have a father who grew up in what we would, we would call modern day India. I have a mother who grew up in what we would call Pakistan. But their ancestors are all from Kashmir, uh, who migrated down to, migrated more south to the Punjab. And so uh, in my time in India, where I spent a lot of time, and I won't go into the details, but I'm not going to be doing as much work there anymore because even though I was, I'm a U.S. citizen, um, I have a very difficult time going to India. I can only go when I have a major grant because there's memorandums of understanding between the countries. I get, I am 
suspect, um, and not all Americans, U.S. citizens are treated equally, and I'm a perfect example of that in terms of our access and our abilities. And so I've now started a project in Morocco, but I'm not working there as much just because it's such a pain to go there. But having spent so much time there, just like in the States, there's race, gender, class, there's hierarchies, there's class hierarchies, and if you're from here, you understand them in a conscious or unconscious way, right? You know how they work. Um, how you speak, uh, how you present yourself will determine whether or not you'll get a job, your gender identity, all those things, right? The same thing in South Asia. Um, and so I created a superhero. She's my alter ego. Her name is Amrita Simla. My father was born in Simla. And the family lived in Amritsar and Simla. And so I wanted to create a superhero who embodied someone that you could only place geographically, but from her name, you could not tell what her religion was, what her caste was. It was my F you to people who look at the world in those categories. I didn't say the bad word, I just referenced. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and so there she exists. She flies the globe, she bears witness. She has a cleavage, I never had a cleavage, I thought my superhero could. He's a little seriously playful, playfully serious, we can infuse it with all those things. So she's a superhero, and I just think there should be more brown and black women identified superheroes flying the globe, telling their own stories on their own terms. Um, we don't have enough of them, we should have more. And so she's in now is part of that hopefully pantheon of superheroes. So I have a whole series that I'm creating on Indian women farmers that I talked about in the introduction. And, um, and so she narrates them, and, I, I, um, and that's an even more expensive endeavor to work with animators and, and to do that. So that's Amrita Simba, and um, some people say change your name. I was like, I'm not changing her name. You can, you can, you can say Machiavelli, you can say Super Friday, Super, I can't say it. Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, you can say Amrita Simla. Um, if anything, um, I am more emboldened to proceed and be bold and be bolder and louder. Um, so does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you very much. Are there any further comments or questions? People sitting on their knees. Thank you. Thank I you for like coming. To, to thank you all, and I, I have a couple of words of thanks. I'm really appreciative of Sara bringing this conversation about food and space and power to us. I feel like food is, is such a good domain for exploring our curiosity. Um, and she's showing us really how you can really delve in and, and get right to the heart of the things that we probably need to be engaging in our generations. And I have a gift. I'm going to respect the space and not have food in the space. I'll give you these gifts when we are out, but for Sylvester and for Sarah for helping set this up so well and have a wonderful event. The Sustainability Program has been hosting, as some of you may know, um, people have been creating icons of the values of sustainability at Hama. And one right now is the year in the world. So we have cookies. They're um, printed on the 3D printers for drawings people have created. So I'd encourage you all to come to our events where we make cookie ideas. And the other is a hand, it's two hands working together to make a heart. Um, so they're, they're the engagement side of sustainability and social justice work that, that I think today has really just wonderfully brought out. I'd also like to say welcome to stay for the reception in the lobby. Hopefully we're getting food set up. Perhaps, Sarah, could you check and see if they come with food? Um, and it's from Cafe Racer, which is a cafe in South Minneapolis that is run by Hamlin and Fox. So, um, Hyper Pride and Abe Buzz. And 